Okay, um, guys, I'm going to kick off. Um, it's um, 11 o'clock and thank you so much um, for everyone who's joining us today. I wasn't sure now that everyone's back to some sort of normality, how many people we'd get, but we had over 50 people registered, which is wonderful. And of course, we have the wonderful um, Sally. And Sally, I know that I've known you for years and years, but what I didn't actually realise that you and I have quite a similar background because I'm just going to read it actually here because you started your career as a travel agent as did I and um, then moved into airline working with hotels in Utah and you had a portfolio of 6,500 hotels which I have to say I take my hat off to you I never had that um, but Sally and um, for those of you who don't know her and I'm sure most of you do but Sally now runs her own company Raspberry Sky which is um, the absolute coolest name in the world for a company um, and helps hotels understand distribution, pricing, um, but also procurement, commercial reviews and project management. Um, and um, so I'm just going to let some more people in here. Um, and well, obviously, Sally is one of the cleverest people um, in the industry. We're absolutely thrilled to have her today. And I think what I love most about Sally whenever we chat is that you just have this 360 view so you understand the distribution you understand the tech and you understand what it's like to be um in a hotel as well so you know i think those kind of skills and um, when you're talking to hotels are invaluable so thanks so much Sally. Um, sorry could i just ask everyone to meet them alistair would you mind i think brandon said it was the right thing to do didn't you but wait until you go and go before we Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let me. Alistair, would you mind just muting yourself? Uh, uh, oh, got it. Perfect. Sorry, there was a fair bit of background noise there. We're just going to keep Alistair quiet in the background. <laughs> um, so, Sally, again, thank you so much um, for being with us today. And um, I suppose everything is changing, as we know, at the minute, um, and there's so much going on. And I know that you've got lots of advice and lots of stuff that we want to talk about. But I thought probably a good place to start was really what patterns we're seeing at the moment, just where you think we are now, how we've come out of this, what has maybe um, changed from what we thought it was going to be, um, and where you think we are as an industry in general. Yeah, sure. Well, well thank you very much uh, for the, the invite and the, and the lovely um, introduction there. So. Uh, what's changed? Everything's changed, hasn't it? I mean, like, you know, it's like customer behaviours have changed. So what, what the thing is, is that what, what do we know? What don't we know? So what, what we do know is that the staycation market is, um, has really taken off, um, partly due to the seasonality. We were straight into school holidays. So, you know, we know people are booking later. Um, they're staying longer, um, but the focus is leisure. So it's leisure destinations. So very much focused at anything rural, you know, countryside, anything non-city kind of related um, is, is doing really well um, during the July and August. Um, and we, we also know that we have had to embrace flexible booking policies because of the uh, desire to be able to cancel, you know, um, at, at short notice. Um, we've had positive feedback, you know, in the last few weeks about, you know, um, members of the public going to restaurants and pubs. So the sort of so the people are feeling a little bit more comfortable with the, the social distancing and some people are going to attractions um, and things like that. Um, and, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, uh, the summer bookings have outweighed the cancellations, which as you all remember before, you know, it was a complete opposite cycle. However, um, you know, we're seeing now in, in places like Spain where quarantine and things have been um, put in place that the cancellations now are outweighing uh, the bookings um, again. Uh, domestically, France and Germany are doing quite well because they um, have, a, have a better uh, domestic market um, than Italy and, and Greece is doing well at the moment uh, because there's no uh, quarantine embargo and, and I'm hoping to go there next Tuesday so long live that live that I can actually get on a flight and, and, and go to, to, to Greece but um, the regions are, are leading um, the market in terms of recovery um, at the moment. Um, Duetto brought out a, a stat um, last week that says that customers are looking but not booking. So in terms of um, 
London, like that's 90% down on the same time last year, and the regions were about 42% down um, on the previous year for August in terms of, of business on the books. And it appears that sort of the budget mid-scale hotels are performing better than the luxury, um, probably because they're more high touch. Um, but um, aviation is a problem, you know, transatlantic flights are not in place. Um, airlines, OAG was reporting that the airlines would be back to about 50.4% recovery. Um, but EasyJet, I think last week, um, announced that they planned a 30% uh, capacity, um, but we're going to increase that for July um, uh, through to September to about 40%. But there's a lot of uncertainty um, in the market and the big players too. So Booking.com um, saying their gross bookings were 91% down in Q2 this year. Saber, you know, had uh, one tenth of their revenue in Q2 for 20 compared to the previous year. So there's a lot of uncertainty. I think we're a little bit in an optimistic bubble um, because um, what we're seeing is a lot of leisure business. And I worry very much about the corporates because for the, the large city center, you know, metropolitan hotels with M&E full service, um, they are really not going to be able to perform until that corporate um, market comes back. So um, Amadeus Insights was saying that obviously the GDS business is down, which we would expect to see because it's primarily um, corporate. Um, and brand.com, a little bit of growth on OTA, but actually a slight increase in uh, direct business. So people are picking up the phone and calling the hotel for validation around, you know, safety, security, etc. So um, I think we've seen an accelerated trend for contactless, you know, contactless um, into integration. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's a changing landscape, Adrian. You know, it's uh, every day is, is something different, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think, Sally, you've touched on so many points there that I'd really like to do kind of um, more of a deep dive into. But just um, for the hotels that are um, here um, that maybe have um, the roots in, in Ireland, the market that we're quite um, predominant in, obviously, we're seeing just exactly as you say, we have hotels stating that they've had their best ever August and they've 80% on upwards of occupancy. And thank goodness everyone is holding rates. And I know Sally and I went through some notes and I'm, I'm going to quote something that you've actually given me, not mine, um, that for customers, McKinsey Research has said the key is still number one is cleanliness, number two is location, and number three is price. So it's just wonderful to see that hotels haven't done that race to the bottom, that we are being a little bit more sensible. But I suppose the flip side of that is we also have city centre hotels that have less than 6% occupancy, which is obviously reflective on that um, corporate and uh, tour business. Um, and I think just before we kind of came on air there, we were talking about that meeting and events. And if you don't mind, do you mind us just maybe reiterating that conversation for those who, who maybe weren't in early that what we were talking about? Because I think that's, um, I've written about it, I know you've written about it, but I think it's um, something worth touching on this morning. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's this, you know, we've got all, well, we always have buzzwords, don't we, in our industry, which is great. The new one is pivot, isn't it? So now we've all got to pivot. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'd like to quote on this because it's software. Software companies talk about pivoting as well. And someone, again, not my quote, someone said to me a couple of years ago, there's no such thing in business as a pivot. It's an awkward shuffle. And I think <laughs> that, <laughs> that to me just sums up what we're all going through at the minute. We're just going to yeah. shuffle here and see if it works and shuffle back again. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Sally. No, no. And, and, I, and I think initially, I mean, I don't know what anyone else thought, but when, when uh, you know, Corona kind of hit, in my mind, it was a three to six month thing, you know, so everything was temporary and, managing through that um, and now we know it's it's got a bit more longevity so hotels that have um &E space, typical meeting space you know not like big event space but meeting space you know I, I have to think there is an opportunity here because many companies are going to continue with home working yeah not not in the short term but in the medium to long term some companies and customers i have are looking to maybe not even go back to offices you know, that maybe have this kind of, you know, transient moving to different hotels, etc. But there is meeting space in hotels that I have to think could be pivoted to hot desking setups. So if you have a meeting room 
that you could put six pods in or four pods in socially distanced because not everybody can work from home you know some of us are fortunate enough to have an office set up you know a spare bedroom or something but if you're working from the kitchen table and you you know other people in your family it's just not conducive to working so i think if you look at that sort of regis model of hot desking i think there's an opportunity to repurpose and pivot some of those meeting rooms into kind of hot desks so that people you know can go somewhere to work even if it's not at the office but in a safe environment that has you know facilities and you'll make on f and b and all that stuff and charging for the hot desk facility i have to think there's an opportunity there yeah no i totally agree and if you think that you know even some of the city centre locations that have bedrooms that are just not being used at the moment yeah. you know that if they're rented out to a particular company and Sally always has room 101, Adrian always has room 102, and they've got the tea and coffee making facilities and that we can make on, on food and beverage. I think there definitely is an opportunity there for some of the hotels, especially those city centre locations, to try um, and work on that dedicated um, workspace. But one of the things that we talked about, and I am going to keep referring to the notes um, that you and I made, but I, I love this term that you use, Sally, your hut button. Oh, you got it. Sorry, I'm not sure what that was. Um, but your hot buttons um, about being sort of easy to do business with. And, um, sorry, I'm just gonna um, just make sure everyone is muted. But can you talk to me maybe a little bit about what you what that term means to you? Those kind of hot buttons. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I've been fortunate, as you said earlier, to work on both the demand and the side, uh, the supply side um, of the industry. And my mantra in everything that we do is always, are you easy to do business with? Whether that's internally or externally. And I always use that as a benchmark for everything that, that we do. And in terms of my hot buttons, um, it's always been back to basics, yeah? Because we can all get very sophisticated with all the new digital tools and development out there. But if your basics um, aren't in place, then you're just not gonna leverage that opportunity. And one of my big bugbears has always been room types, yeah? So many years ago, I went to, um, I was speaking at a conference in Scandinavia and there was a Scandinavian hotelier who talked about his experience of opening a, in a relatively new hotel and brand. And he was saying, look, you know, I've been open for X period of time and I have a lot of standard rooms and they are quite small. And then I have, you know, my superior rooms and whatever. And he said, my number one complaint that I continually get that we are trying to manage is the complaint that my standard rooms are too small. And he said, and on all the descriptions, we put the, you know, the size of it in meters and in feet, imperial, and you know, whatever. We express it in the textual terms, but 80% of my complaints are that my standard rooms are too small. So he changed his room type description to tiny. Overnight, his <laughs> complaints just died because you're never going to get somebody complaining that a room is too small if it's called a tiny room. If you booked a tiny room, it's tiny. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a lesson there. And there's also something around um, experiences and people wanting to engage with your brand and your property. So we see lots more now the use of things like generous, cozy, spacious, you know, tiny, uh, medium, bigger, to try and explain what it is. Because let's face it, a classic superior executive standard means absolutely nothing to a guest um, at all. And I don't know about you, if I walk into a bedroom, I open the door and I either go, it's a bit small, or I go, it's about right, or I go, it's a suite. You know, for my customers, there are three, <laughs> there are three room types, you know, but I've worked with many hotels who think they've got 15 plus room types because one's got a slight window, one's got an extra corner bit. And actually from a customer perspective, they really don't care. They want to have to make it to be easy to understand. And if you overlay all those room types with all the different rate types that we used to have, particularly around restricted rates, et cetera, you know, advanced purchase, you're left with this medley of rate return that, you know, you, the customers need an Excel spreadsheet to work out what is the best offer. And that's just not right. And that's where the OTAs have done really well because they make it really simple and easy to, to do business with. 
So I think for me, um, getting the basics right, um, re-looking at your room types is really important. But the other thing I think is, is, is really key, and one of the hot buttons we do a lot when we do uh, commercial reviews is we look at people's system process. So I urge everyone on this call who, who is working in a, in a hotel to get a blank sheet of paper and just write on there all the different systems that you have in your hotel in order to operate everything and put a box around it, all of them. And you'll be amazed how many they are. And then try and connect them and say, right, which ones of these are interfaced? Which ones do we manually update and which ones are interfaced? And if they're interfaced, draw a line between the systems that are interfaced and the arrow. Is it one way? Is it two way? If it's manual, maybe do a dotted line or something or a red line or something. And look at that and say, is that best of breed? In, in, in the world that we live in today, is this IT stack setting me up for success in the digital world that we know we need to be in? And then if you then look at the processes, the business processes in sales, in revenue, in finance, in operations, you will be alarmed at the amount of manual intervention, intervention duplication, reports that are produced and we don't even know why, that take time um, and it really helps you get your head around, you know, is, is, this, is this my future landscape? And to help you think about, you know, is now the time, and I know it's difficult because revenue is an issue, but is it now is the time to relook at my IT or my, my systems infrastructure and say, could I do it better? Is there a better way? Yeah, I completely agree with you, Sally, and I think that's one of my bugbears is when, um, you go into a hotel and you do that kind of mapping out and you say well if you do this this and this it's going to cost you x and everyone just looks at that cost but it is the cost of ignoring um that i think is is critical right now and hoteliers will spend 10 20 grand on you know something in the kitchen or new crockery or an oven or whatever but they won't necessarily look at their technology stack and exactly what you said there why they're missing out um and the opportunities and every single um opportunity to make money and to make you clever as a business in my opinion, is way more important than you know than anything else right at, right at this moment. It's understanding your data, understanding your customer, understanding those new market trends, and then how you're going to meet um, those market trends. So I think that is um, really really important. Um, so just going to say, you know, the question to also ask is, you know, what is the cost of not changing it? Yes. You know, that's the other thing, you know, and there will always be a cost and, um, uh, you know, um, an impact to your business potentially of, of changing a system. We know it's heavy lifting. You know, if you want to change one of your, you know, key systems, such as your PMS, whether it's heavy lifting, we get that, you know, um, and it is a big decision to make. But if you don't make those decisions, what is the impact? What will you not be able to do? And what does the future customer journey look like? And, you know, as you said, Adrian, it's all about data and understanding the new customer. And if you don't have access to that data um, and understand how your customers are behaving, it's really difficult to try and, you know, predict what, you know, is going to happen next week or the week after or how you should communicate or what you should communicate to who, you know? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think sometimes, you know, I, I hate the term, anyone who who knows me knows that I hate that term big data because okay. you just need useful data. You need to understand what is actually important to your business. Stop pulling those 27 page reports that mean nothing to anyone that are out of date the moment that you look at them. Start actually understanding what is critical to your business. Um, we do have a pile of things that I want to talk to you about, but just when we're talking about technology, um, I think what is really important is you've got, again, this wonderful bird's eye view of what's happening and what's going on. And I know that there was a couple of technology providers that you thought might be interesting for the people on the call to talk about. And I wondered, is, is a, a now a good time just to maybe throw that in and then we can yeah, kind of get blind and, and talk about some of the other stuff as well? Yeah, no, sure, sure. So um, we all know that the, the you know the, the digital landscape has changed, and um, I spend um, a lot of time looking at you know new technology companies and trying to understand uh, what they offer, so that you know we can give advice in terms of what systems are out there. 
And recently there are three companies that I've spoken to that for whatever reason, I think they're doing something quite different and unique and I just wanted to share that with you. So um, I don't know if you've heard of um, Odamo, which is a digital menu ordering and, and payment tool for hotels and restaurants. But in my experience in the last three weeks, the first time I went out to a, a pub in the Cotswolds, you know, social distancing, my first eating out experience, we were told that we had to, you know, um, order, order for our phone. So I'm like, yeah, that's not a problem at all. So we need to just go on and download this app. So we went and downloaded the app, which took a few minutes because we then had to connect to their Wi-Fi because there wasn't any 4G. So that took a few minutes. We then downloaded the app. And when we get into the app, not only do they want your name, your, you know, your birth date, your email address, your whatever, you've got to go through this whole registration process. And frankly, all we want is a drink at that point. Yeah, <laughs> we just want to go order. Drink at any point. Order anything, you know. So. So of course, then you get the menu up and it says, well, if you, if, you, if you order through this app, which we didn't get a choice about, then you'll get a 10% discount. Well, at this point, we're kind of like, we're not really bothered now. We just, you know, so we're trying to order and we order all the stuff and then you have to pay. So I'm, I'm with a friend and we would probably split the bill ordinarily, but this just gives a choice of one payment. So immediately my customer experience and the, am I, are they easy to do business with as you know this is not working and furthermore when we paid we realized we didn't get the 10% off so it was just a you know nasty experience what Adamo has is a hundred percent web-based um, product which you don't have to download an app yeah and you just go in and it's got a QR code so you take your photo and you scan the QR code menu comes up and you can order integrated with the payment system so it's completely hassle-free it keeps the it keeps the data so if, if you want to order a drink and a starter and then you decide oh actually i wouldn't mind a coffee and somebody wanted to you can just do that it keeps you keeps your information and you and then, then do all the payment and stuff so the whole experience is just is just different so i think they're they're really good because um a lot like a lot of these um tools at the moment they are you know offering free setup you know a lot of a lot of these technology companies are offering offers during this time. So that's one I would seriously look at if you want to um, digitalize your, your menus and your ordering and your payments so that you know you are contactless. That's, that's a good one. The other one is a company called Ask Suite. Now, this is a chatbot company. And I have to tell you, I am not a chatbot fan. Um, every time you go onto a bank or a utility company or you want to return an item of clothing and up comes that chatbot you know the amount of time on that you lose the will to live and you'll never get that life back you know it's they're horrendous but um i was recently introduced to ask suite um and they are um a a, a chatbot with artificial intelligence that is 100 percent de dedicated to hotels and resorts. So they don't play in other, any other space. So all of their AI is hotel industry, resort industry data. So they're really smart at that stuff. But the thing that's really cute about this company is they're integrated with the booking engines. So they have 30 plus booking integrations. So whether you're with Synexis or Travel Click Amadeus or whomever, um, from an IBE perspective, it means that um, the way the chat box works is that you can even ask for availability in the chat box. You know, do you have a room for the, you know, 14th of September for two nights? And it will return availability if it's with the room types and images. If it doesn't, it will say no, but the, the next available dates would be this. Um, but more than that, it can manage all that textual content. And if you remember when I mentioned before that there's been this increase of calls direct to hotels, that said, that said, and has an impact for the hotels for having people to physically man the phones. And what the chatbot does is, in a really um, clever way, um, enables the, the hotel to manage um, a lot of those inquiries um, in an automated way. Um, but also, because it has a portal, um, it means that the, the hotel can dynamically update information all the time. So as we know, the environments are changing, you know, like government policies are changing, etc. cetera. Um, you can change the wording, which is sometimes a lot easier than actually having to change the text on the website. So for instance, you know, if I want to go and uh, have a meeting in a lounge at a hotel, I can Google that hotel, but I haven't got a clue whether they're actually open for non-residents to come in and, and have coffee. That sort of information um, can be um, supported 
They support languages. Um, it works on desktop, it works on mobile. They won the Hotel Tech Award in 2020 for the States. Um, they're GDPR compliant. Um, and there's a great example in the UK. There's a hotel called um, the Gillipin, Gil Gillipin in the Lake District. Um, if you go on their website. So in the middle of the pandemic, they had about three and a half thousand chats um, on, on their website. Um, and it's a neat tool. It's definitely one um, to have a look at if you want to try and um, field some of those repetitive questions um, that you're getting um, from guests that are, are, are calling, you, calling you directly. Um, and you can put all your COVID stuff on there and you can put all your safety and your hygiene and stuff on there. So that I really like, and I don't particularly like chatbots, but this one I, I really like. I know you've seen it as well, Adrian. Yeah, I love that. I could have stayed playing with it all day. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nifty. It's a pretty nifty tool. So following the same thing, I don't get excited about some technology. The other one I just want to mention is uh, Foursuite, which is a mobile key solution. And I recently had a demo um, from, from Foursuite. And I posted actually afterwards that I don't normally get excited about key card solutions, but actually this one is, is really super cool. Um, so again, there's no downloading of an app. Um, there's no logging in. They send you a link and they're social. So if you prefer to get your um, communication through WhatsApp or Facebook, they can do that. But it is absolutely dynamic. And um, the other thing that they do, which I think is really neat, is if you've already got locks, and one of the big barriers has always been, when I've worked with hotels, is they already have a key card solution where you put your little credit card on. And the CapEx cost to replace locks is huge. So what Foursuite can do is they can convert your existing locks so that it can take a, you know, a, a, a tap on from the phone, or if the customer prefers, because we want to be easy to do business with, and they don't have a smartphone, they can also use the, um, the credit card thing to, to get in. Um, so guest, guest choice is there. Um, what else is there? They have real-time connectivity to most of the PMSs, and it truly is dynamic, you know? So if you've got a room that's being cleaned and it's not available and it can message, et cetera, I mean, it's, 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 it's really, really super cool. So if you have, you know, traditional key card, um, locks on your doors and you really want to move to being contactless then this is something that you should look at because it's a cost-effective way of converting your existing real estate into a digital world um, and um, it just improves the whole guest experience it, it, it really really does but for me I think um, the reason I've mentioned those three companies, and there are lots of companies out there uh, and all sorts of different technologies, is all three companies are really nice people. And I think in this time uh, that we're in, um, it's nice to do people, to do business with people who are nice. And do you know what? I think when we're in these difficult landscapes and we need help and we may need to sort of, you know, ask more questions or have more support, it's nice to know you're working with a partner who really cares and all three of those co companies really go the extra mile. And from my experience of dealing with them, they're just nice people to do business with. And I just think that's so important. Well, what I'll do, um, Sally, is um, most of you know who, um, who've joined these before, um, afterwards I'll send out a recording. Um, and what I'll do is I will make sure that um, the links to those companies are, are added in. And just so that everyone is obviously very clear, neither Sally or, or I have links to those companies. We're not trying to push them, you know, because we're going to retire to our yacht somewhere because of <laughs> retiring or anything. Um, but it's just, it's really good when, when sometimes, you know, people who are working in the industry that see some of these, you know, great, sexy new products can, can just talk about them um, because things are changing, as you said, so quickly and technology is moving so quickly. And I think it's, it's sometimes it's really great just to come out of the hotels, see, see some other stuff that's happening and, and know what's happening in, in the technology space because it's the people who are adopting that technology and, and looking at new and funky innovative ways to do things are the ones in my opinion that are going to come out of this a little bit stronger um, for yeah, sure. I agree. I agree. yeah so i wonder if i could maybe um pull you back a little bit to, to some of the stuff that we talked about earlier and that is um 
you know, looking at um, the opportunities that we have on brand at the moment. So we know, um, I just written down yesterday, you've said already, um, Booking.com have made a quarter of their workforce um, redundant, which, listen, uh, everyone who knows me knows that I'm not a huge fan of Booking.com, but these are real people's lives, you know, so that, that is, you know, very tragic. TripAdvisor's revenue is down 86%. And my personal feeling, and, and you did touch on it earlier, is that we have this unique opportunotypy at the moment that you know you want to go to the Cotswolds to your favorite hotel, or you know you want to go to Galway or um, in Skillen or Dublin or whatever. You know where you want to go and you know the, the property that you potentially want to stay in. Um, so we are more likely to book that direct, but can you maybe talk me through some of the things that you think that we have the opportunity to do on your own um, brand site and how we can continue to keep that momentum or to pull some of the stuff away from channel or, or OTA channels or, or even if we can? I think, I think what's important and, and nothing's changed here, right? So we all want to drive more business direct. Yeah, that's, that's a given. However, um, what's really important is your distribution mix. So we know we're going to work with OTAs and we know we're going to work with GDSs because they provide, you know, really important business. But I think what we're seeing now with people um, coming direct and wanting to ask the questions is just a huge opportunity, isn't there? So um, I, think, I think one of the things is that's really important is about training of your people who do answer the phone. Because I've had this scenario myself where... I've been, you know, I am quite a, a big booking.com fan, I have to say, if I'm traveling myself because I find it has everything on there. But I may well find the hotel and then maybe call the hotel direct. So when I call the hotel direct, sometimes I can't find the same rate on their website. I might call them. And I say, I, I can see this rate. I'm looking on booking.com. You know, it's 120 quid for the night. You know, can I book that with really you direct? And I can tell you nine times out of ten, that person says no. No, you need, you need to you need to get that rate, which actually is cheaper or, you know, whatever. Um, you need to you need to book that with booking.com. To me, that's crazy. You know, so I think there's a training element there that if anyone calls to make a booking, um, as long as it's, you know, not a neg rate through a certain channel or something, you know, it's a member of the public, then convert that booking. But I think another biggie is because we're so focused on um, short term and changes, make sure you've got availability. For 2021 you make sure all of your channels so what's really important is a really good distribution mix but you can only get that mix when the business picks up if you have a great availability so I think brand.com is a massive massive opportunity for everybody at the moment um, and I think there's a number of things that that, that we can do um, and a lot of these you know other people are you know with these webinars been going on for days weeks and months. Well, so, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm going to tell you anything new but <laughs> um, think about you know a landing page um, that really promotes you know the services that you offer at this time you know so whether it's your menus your restaurants your lounge areas your services your pools anything you know that sort of differentiates you in terms of space be that indoor space or, or outdoor space um, Think about the chatbot things. I think that is actually really, really important and will help to drive conversion um, and reduce the number of calls. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for add-ons and upselling as well. So um, I think about, think about, you know, the rate, but then think about what additional services you can add on, not necessarily included in the rate, you know, but maybe as a, as a post stay activity, um, there was, a, there was a webinar the other day with um, Henry Hartfelt, um, an American gentleman who's pretty well established. And he was saying customers have two wallets. They have first wallet and the second wallet. First wallet is the purchase of the room. Yeah. So I've got a budget of, and I want to spend X, and I'm booking that. And at that point, they're not always in for the upsells. But actually, once they've booked that, and they've had time to think about it, they might go, actually, it would be really nice to pre-book a dinner or have, you know, a spa treatment or to, you know, have a celebrationary champagne or can we pre-book a cream tea or, or whatever. So there's a second wallet opportunity. So I think, you know, um, engaging with those people post-booking prior to arrival as well um, is really important. Um, badges and accreditations, yeah. So there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it out there. Visit Britain has one I know a lot of the, um, the hotels in the UK um, have that accreditation so they can put on there that they've been through a process to say you know from a COVID perspective for hygiene and, 
and safety has been kind of, you know, signed off. But there are searchable ones as well, like on TripAdvisor um, and on Sabre and, people, and, and things like that. So make sure your badges and accreditations are completely um, up to date and think about, you know, products and experiences. Think about, you know, if you were wanting to go away and stay at this time, and remember, it is all leisure at the moment. It will hopefully move into more local SME corporate business. But start thinking about things that are important. I mean, hand pick hotels came out last week with a mailing about dog friendly breaks, you know, right on the money, you know, people wanting to go away, kids, dogs, you know, families, etc. cetera. Um, but think about your unique elements, you know, why would they book direct? So, so maybe things like, you know, we have great parity issues, but maybe you would say, you know, when you're mailing, if you book direct, we'll give you a free room upgrade subject to availability um, or more flexible booking conditions um, and things like that. So I think from a brand.com perspective, it kind of, you just, you just need to be easy to do business with and maybe think about meta search, you know, driving business direct to um, your brand.com um, website as well. And I think in um, Google now have, uh, what do they call it? I wrote it down, pay per stay model. So for the hotel ads platform. So you, you, you can deduct cancellations and no-shows, so you can control the cost a bit more. So that's, you know, and there's lots of those sort of things that are out and about, um, just to keep an eye out for. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I've probably been harping on about this for a few years, that I, my own personal feelings are that the booking.com and the Expedia's are going to be around for a long time. Of course they are. But I think the player to watch is definitely Google. And, um, you know, they've got all our, our search history. They know what we're doing. They know the kind of person you are, what you like to buy, where you like to go, you know, what sites you browse. And if there's anyone who's perfectly placed to, to understand our travel needs, I think it's going to be Google. And I think having that flexible approach that Google seemed to be coming out with, a, a little bit more flexible in the OTAs, I think they'll win not only customer loyalty, but hotel loyalty. And, um, you know, and the end of the day, we all go to Google to search, and if they own they own that platform, they own that space. I think that's that's going to be definitely something. But what if what if, what if someone like Amazon was to buy a OTA, yeah, and then you yeah. could you know, Alexa, can you tell me what's available? And you could just verbalize it. You know, I mean, like you know, there's there's just huge opportunity here, isn't there? And I and I think that sort of thing will happen in the future. Oh, I think that's going to happen in 2021. If not by the end of this year, I think there's definitely going to be um, an Amazon buy of an OTA. And there's certainly it's been a few snips. I know you and I have been at events where we've heard that. So, yeah, I think that that's probably coming around the corner. It's so funny you mentioning some of those things about, you know, making sure that you've got the best rates online. Um, because I literally just threw something out. I think I'd said you have been writing a blog for about two weeks and I haven't got one <laughs> publishing it. So that went out this morning. But... I agree with you. And when I look at the hotels within our portfolio, everyone was planning or assuming, and none of us obviously knew what was going to happen, but during COVID that we'd probably see a really strong August and then that things would start to dip in September. Truthfully, and, and I know that there's going to be cancellations, so I'm, I'm not that naive, but a lot of the hotels that are having good August are also having good September, October, November. So they're trending and pacing way ahead because there could be families that may not be able to get together right now because of shielding or, you know, they've got family gatherings or weddings or, you know, just people maybe getting together and not wanting to go away just so early that they do want to go away September, October and even into next March. So, you know, my advice, you know, sitting on top of yours would be, yes, make sure that you have that availability online and make sure that you're ready for those rates um, um, online as well, that you have those rates um, in place um, for um, the winter time because, you know, those people are going to come and I think do, we need to be ready for the different kind of staycation that's going to happen in the winter. So, you know, what can we do for those people to make sure that they do feel safe and but you know show them activities tell them about things that are opening in the area um you know so that they know that you are open for business that you're welcoming and that they can do things when when they get um you know when they get to your location so i think that's really important to not just be panicking about you know the next few weeks or few months yeah. but actually to be looking into next year i think it's really really important 
And I think people do want to do that. I think people who had planned to, to meet or go to events that have been cancelled, that have now been, you know, reallocated to 2021, I think people want to be able to hold that accommodation, hold those, you know, hold, hold those celebrations, move it a year out. You know, there's a lot of that happening. And we're seeing that in terms of booking trends, uh, you know, for 12 months out, literally, you know. Um, so, yes, I mean, if you, if you don't have rates loaded, you're, you're not available. So um, then people look at alternatives. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I suppose one of the things that we had talked about when you and I were planning on this was this kind of key to success. And I know that you've touched on some of it is understanding that um, distribution channel and that it is changing. But is there anything we can dig down on that a little bit further, um, Sally, to give people some you know, advice and takeaways on, on that distribution channel and what do they need to do? Where do they need to be thinking about, you know, if GDS is dying, should they still be putting that same amount of um, effort into GDS right now? Um, you know, if, they're, if, the, if that corporate market has fallen away, you know, is there any sort of tips or advice on that, that key to success that we can maybe just um, dig a little deeper on? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, don't don't uh, ignore any channel. Um, corporate market will come back. <laughs> I just don't know when it will be. Um, but uh, the 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 GDS is used by the travel agent community um, primarily. Um, but I think what's really interesting to understand, and uh, we did I did an interview recently with Neil Armagy, who is the ex CEO of Win Advantage and TMC. And he was saying, you know, what, the, what they've learned and through a project that we did with them is that there's a lot of leakage around where travel agents are booking. So, yes, you know, you're at your, your corporate rates, your negotiated rates on the GDS. Absolutely. Yes. But actually, those business travel agents are still being asked to book leisure as well. So they're still looking at, you know, a propensity to book some of that on the GDS, but also other other um, channels, um, too. But um, the GDS is, I think, uh, as, as a ch it's a prime channel. And for a city centre hotel, you know, it's, it's highly important. So make sure that, again, it's a bit like you said about auditing all your systems and writing your boxes. Take this time to make sure that you have the best shop front you could possibly have across all your channels. So on the GDS, uh, Sabre have recently brought out... Um, uh, a searchable field. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. Let me just have a look if I made a note of it. Um, that um, enables the travel agent to to search by hotels that have complied to their safety and hygiene requirements. So it's important that you work with your CRS providers to make sure that your storefront is as best as it possibly can in exactly the same way that you would do that across the OTAs and your social media, et cetera. So um, yes, it's um, content is, is, is king in all of this, you know? And so the content that you had 12 months ago is not really valid anymore. So you need to think about new ways of writing um, your content and what's really important. And that doesn't change with the GDS really. You still need to make sure that your key messages are on there. Agents still need to be able to access that information to be able to give the best advice. And I think travel agents are really well placed, um, travel management companies, to give that advice to corporates and to help them through this time. So yes, um, a really important. The other thing that's important with channel, um, which uh, I think you help them people with on, with your tool, is around cost of distribution. So really understanding um, by channel. So if you can pull a report that gives your ADR an average length of stay by channel and then calculate by channel what your commission levels are. And if you're managing that channel in an automated way versus manual way, um, and if it's manual, assign a cost to that. You know, think about from a time and motion perspective, if someone has to go and manually up the channel once a day or once a week or whatever it is and then take reservations and manually put them into the PMS you know how much time does that take associate a cost with that and any agent commission that there is etc and any uh, technology fees there are and work out your net your net value per channel and then be cognizant of that when you're negotiating rates and um, when you're looking at your distribution channel mix I mean we haven't got the we haven't got the um, the beauty of being able to choose too much at the moment in terms of where we want our business from. 
However, being aware of that will help you manage that as demand picks up and being cognizant across your sales, marketing and operational team as to what that looks like. So that when somebody calls and says, I'm looking at a rate on Expedia, can I book that direct? They go, absolutely, yes, I'll take that booking. You know, because they understand that if I take it by that channel, I'm paying X, Y, Z cost. Yeah. So cost of distribution is really important. Yeah. And I think to Sally, the, the most effective hotels that um, I've worked with over the last 20 odd years are the ones who communicate that all the way down. You know, so some hotels hold their profit and their costs and everything really tight because they don't want their teams to understand. Trust me, when your team member goes out the, the front door, they've forgotten, you know, everything because they've got a life out there. So, you know, don't be afraid of sharing those figures. And actually, the report that you're talking about um, within our system, when we're looking at the new suite of reports that we've added, it is the one that's being used repeatedly at the moment because people want to put in the price that they're selling and understand, you know, the cost of sale. And then actually, if they put a 99 quid rate on, work everything out, how much are they making? And just something that I, I'm sure you've done the same cost analysis, Sally, but whenever I go into hotels and we do break everything down, exactly what you're saying there, that you, know, you might say, oh, well, my commission is 15% or 18% or whatever. When, as an average at the moment, um, what we are looking at is probably an OTA commission of around 21 to 23 percent when you take their commission plus the costs of maybe having a channel manager like SiteMinder um, or managing that booking um, manually and then what you potentially have to pay to Meta to get those bookings um, through because there's a percentage of leakage onto the OTAs. So I think to say that, oh, I've got 15% commission on a certain channel is actually quite naive at the moment, yeah. you know, and we understand why people do that because that's what they sell themselves as. But I think you genuinely need to understand a, an OTA is coming in with a cost of sale of around 23%. And you just need to be realistic. And if you can say to your front office people, your reservation people, this booking, if it comes through, is going to cost me 23%, take it. You know, take it, as you say, take that booking on the phone. If you can, turn that booking around and all of those um, pines will add up to, to um, helping your bottom line. So I completely, completely agree with that. And it's the same old, same old, isn't it? You know, like cost of acquisition is far higher than, you know, cost of repeat. So, you know, I think that's the other thing is, you know, it's, it's, it's really marketing to your existing database, isn't it? And trying to, you know, entice them back as well as obviously driving new business. But, you know, it's about really leveraging the data. And that's, I think that's the kind of, <clears throat> that's the, I guess that's the, 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 the challenge for our industry is um, in a hotel, you have so many silos of data with great data, really, really great data, you know, um, and it's being able to sort of pull that together into a story and being able to communicate personalized you know the communication to customers because you know um what was it uh the re atmosphere research said uh recently only 20 percent of customers receive offers that reflect their lifestyle and their requirement wow. so a lot of noise a lot of noise and you know as an industry we should be better at it we're not because what I said before, we have the boxes and they don't interface and they don't connect. So you've got your quality of sale information that doesn't talk to your profile information that, you know, um, your spa or your whatever. We just don't really have that joined up piece. Um, but data is going to be so, so important um, moving forward. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, that I love that comment that you said earlier about the second wallet. I've never yeah. used that. I've never heard that. But certainly when we talk to hotels we always say that when you're quoting something like an upgrade you know they've already put 100 pounds in their head they've spent that for the room just tell them the upgrade is 20 don't say it's going to cost you 120 just say and you can upgrade for 20 pounds or you can have dinner for 25 pounds or, or whatever it is because we all do it you know psychologically in our own head we all we always make that leap up well i've budgeted for this and now that extra thing is only going to be that. And I think that's... It's female mentality, isn't it? Like, we bought the dress, and now the shoes are not so expensive because we already have the dress. You know, it's kind of like, I've done that piece, but I can got a little bit more money for a little bit of an extra something, you know? And, and you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And I know we're kind of almost out of time, but one thing I just wanted to touch on, and I know you and I had a conversation about it yesterday, and it brought it into my head because one of our team members um, was out for dinner last night in a beautiful restaurant. I won't name the restaurant, but in a beautiful restaurant. And as soon as she arrived, she was met at the door and was told, um, we're, we're now wearing masks from today. This is what we're doing. And was literally felt like was talked to and talked at and talked at and talked at about their health and safety and this is what they were doing and this is making them feel uncomfortable and this is what they would have to do. And at the end of the day, all they wanted to do was sit down and have a lovely meal. And yes, be told, you know, you're very welcome, we're wearing masks, we hope this doesn't make you feel uncomfortable and um, this is the process that we're going through. But it was constant and then at the end of the meal, did you feel uncomfortable about this? What did you, you know, did you not? And it was, we just wanted some normality and I think, yeah. yes, using that experience as a, you know, it was, it was too much. But sometimes when I look at some of the websites, just to re reiterate what you said earlier was that content is so important, but it's making it sound that you're a hotel, you're damn good at hospitality, come mm -hmm. and be welcomed, come and have a wonderful time where we are, and we're ticking all the boxes for you. We, you know, we've done the cleaning, you're going to be safe and putting it in a really natural way because people don't want to feel like they're coming into a hospital. No, absolutely. And I think and I think this is where independent hotels and small chains have really got the advantage. So I give an example. So someone I know recently went to stay in uh, Cambridge in a very well-known um, large hotel group. So the check-in experience was okay. The restaurant was closed. Um, it was room service only. So when they look at the room service menu, and you're going to know who this is just by what I'm telling you, it's a burger and a chicken Caesar salad are the two options. Yeah. It's just not great, is it? You know, like there's no excuse really for that. Yeah. And then you take the experience of something like <clears throat> the Pig Hotels, which are in the UK, um, owned by homegrown hotels, small, ho small country house hotels, 15, 20 rooms. I'm not having any non-resident people, but they have a 25 mile radius uh, uh, menu and they are able to serve a really good breakfast, a really good lunch, a really good dinner without loads of signage, people social distancing, tables you know, set appropriately, but actually have a really nice experience. So I think this is really where independent hotels and small chains can really accelerate and, you know, differentiate themselves because it doesn't have to be clinical. You know, we get it. We get it. You know, we've been, been doing this since March. People who want to go away want to have a positive experience. Um, and, you know, and there are the ways that you can do that without having huge signage. And as you were saying, you know, this very clinical kind of approach. Um, I think there's, there's a happy medium there. And I think, you know, thinking about the food that you're serving and you may have limited kitchen staff, but it isn't a burger and a chicken Caesar salad. That isn't why people are going to go and stay, you know? So thinking creatively about food, you don't have to have a massive menu, but you do have to have things that you might actually be interested in eating. Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree. I just wonder, has anyone, um, any questions for Sally? Because we're kind of, um, we're almost out of time. We're probably over time, if I'm honest. But um, has anyone any questions um, that they'd like to put to Sally? Um, you can either do it in the chat box, or I know a, a certain person who I think is still online um, likes to ask some questions. Um, no, he's not here. He's gone. Um, oh. I know. We can usually um, rely on Alta for a lovely question or two. Um, but anyone, any questions that they want to put to the wonderful Sally while, while we have her here? Everyone's very quiet today, Sally. It's not like that. It's August. Everybody wants to be on holiday. <laughs> it's, so, it's so hot. I'm about to spontaneously combust. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, the kind of takeaways, if we don't have any questions, I think for me, the takeaways is get that flip chart out. Draw where you are on your technology stack. See what's working, what's not working, what you're getting value off, what you could be doing better. Um, and that not looking necessarily at the bottom line cost, but what that cost is of ignoring um, the holes in your technology. And if it means having um, you know, some sort of expenditure, and let's be honest, everyone in our space is really moving to a SaaS model rather than CapEx spending. So you know, look at how you know, we could maybe look at, you know, look, that is CapEx, it's done, but how is 
any of these new services, technology, these providers actually going to um, contribute to my business and make us stronger and, and, and more educated and, and a better place to do business. And I think that's my key takeaway. And I will be drawing that out from now on on every single hotel I go into. So anyone um, is here that uh, knows me, if I come into, um, uh, into their hotel, get the flip toilet out, I'm going to do it. I had a lovely message from Vicky, and I know you sent it to me privately, Vicky, but I'm going to shout it out. Vicky does normally ask questions. Vicky's, um, again, super clever lady in our industry, looking after hundreds, if not thousands, of bedrooms bedrooms across um, Ireland um, and uh, she's an inspiration to me for sure but she's just gone I normally ask a question but you've covered a lot you've been very helpful so thank you so much Vicky um, but I think yeah that's my key takeaway today is map that out um, look at your content look at what you're doing on rates look at your availability look at how you're communicating and meeting those guest requirements and to me that that stat that you gave of 20% of people aren't getting the, the rates, the packages, um, the experience that they actually want sold to them. I think that's shame on us. We should, be, we should know our guests. We should be sitting in reception and listening to what's going on and listening to the kind of people and seeing who's actually in our hotel and understanding that. Oh, I was going to say, here is the wonderful Al Taff back again. It's normally Al Taff that asks the question. Um, so yeah, those are the, the key takeaways um, that I have today. But if no one has any more questions, Sally, I just want to say massive, massive thank you. Um, oh, Des, uh, all good on my side. Thanks so much from a freezing South Africa. Um, <laughs> so up for Des, and so, well, I'd love to be. South Africa is one of my favorite countries, so I'd, I would swap you anytime. Um, but I, I will send out the recording. I'll send out the links to the um, software um, companies that you mentioned and some of those other hotels that maybe have those chat boxes and things. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and the other thing, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a little shout out. Um, most of you may already know that we've got a link up with the wonderful HOSPA um, to uh, offer their uh, certificate in revenue management. Our wonderful Kirsty's just gone through her first um, module and is, is about to do her second. So we have a new intake starting on the 14th of September. We've been very privileged to get a discounted rate um, from HOSPA. So if you have a few hundred quid, trust me, it is well worth spending the money to educate yourself or one of your team um, on revenue management. So if anyone would like any more information on that, you know, all know how to contact me, just give me a shout. Um, we've got, I think, six or seven people going through this intake and we'd love another intake for the 14th of September and, and well worth it if you can. Listen, guys, thank you so much for um, everything. Really appreciate your time. Um, Sally, you've been a star as always. And I can't wait to come to London and have a gin and tonic with you. Absolutely. That's Perfect. a deal. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Right, guys, thanks so much. Take care. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.